In today's lesson and then also on Thursday, I want to talk about the world's hydrosphere. So essentially the water budget that's found on the planet. So I want to introduce the idea of the hydrologic cycle. So I'll do that in a second. But today I want to focus mainly on the water that is in the subsurface. So we're going to talk about groundwater. And then um, later on this week, we'll talk about surface water, uh, rivers and lakes, and then uh, the hazards and resources associated with that. But one of the reasons why I think it's very important to talk about um, uh, water, uh, not only in terms of it as a resource, but also as a commodity, um, is uh, because there's lots of people thinking that, you know, while right now there's a lot of strife in the world associated with who has oil reserves or fossil fuel reserves, um, I think as the population continues to increase, one of the biggest issues that um, many parts of the world are going to have is having access to enough fresh water to uh, satisfy the demands not only of their population, but also for agricultural needs and whatever else. So I think uh, this quote is very telling, and I realize that it's from 1995, but, um, but I do think it's still an important quote here that if the wars of this century, and of course they're talking about the 1900s, uh, were fought over oil, the wars of the next century will be fought over water. And so we're talking here about freshwater use. And uh, unless we change our approach to managing this precious and vital resource. So we'll talk about water for the rest of the week. And today, like I said, we're going to talk mainly about groundwater. And so um, what is it? Where do we get it? And why do we need it? Um, I've put on, as you learn, a great um, animation that I helped develop with uh, a, a publishing company called Cengage Learning. Um, and it, it is a, a little bit of a rough draft. So there is one or two spelling errors um, and there's still a watermark on one of the videos. But um, if you don't, um, if, if it's much more, uh, I think, uh, clear if you watch that animation about the hydrologic cycle, it essentially shows you how water throughout the planet um, essentially recycles. I mean, the amount of water that we have on the planet is fixed, right? Like we're not constantly making more fresh water. Um, but it essentially cycles throughout um, the Earth's hydrosphere. So we would talk about here the hydrosphere, right? That's essentially where you would have lots of Earth's water. Um, and so the oceans, of course, are huge reservoirs of Earth's water. And then through the process of like evaporation, you can then move water into Earth's atmosphere. Uh, changing the temperature of that water, of course, can then make it condense into, you know, clouds and whatever else. And then it can actually then rain down. And when it does, when it rains down, it can either move into uh, the surface realm, which we call runoff. And surface runoff goes into, you know, ponds or whatever else, and then into rivers, lakes, and then eventually back to the ocean. Or that water can go into, if it's very cold, it can go into the cryosphere. So we'll put ice over here, right? This is the Earth's cryosphere. Cryosphere means the frozen water on the planet. And last but not least, if it doesn't become runoff or ice, what it can actually then do is eventually infiltrate down into the subsurface to become groundwater. And so groundwater is a very big protected reserve of water on the planet. There are essentially two zones uh, where water can go in the subsurface. The first zone here is what we call the Vados zone. This is essentially where water is trapped between soil particles. So it's kind of like soil moisture. But the important part to remember here is that the Vados zone is undersaturated with respect to water. So there's still lots of air in the undersaturated zone. And you can imagine that the water is just kind of held as either droplets or like a thin film around individual soil particles. In the second soil zone, we that's called the phreatic zone, this is what we call the uh, saturated zone of soil. This is below what we would call the water table. So the water table would sit right here, and the water table is the boundary between the Vados zone and the phreatic zone. And below the water table, the entire um, ground surface is saturated with respect to groundwater. That means there's very little to no air in between um, sedimentary particles. Pretty much all of the space between grains is filled with water. So um, I would encourage you to watch that, uh, that animation on As You Learn. You can go check it out. In fact, I just posted it, so it's there for you. So um, check that out and then come on back and we can continue talking about the, um, the hydrologic cycle and groundwater.
biologically, humans need about one gallon of water per day. So that's in terms of, you know, what you need to ingest in order to maintain biological life. Um, the actual use of uh, water per American per day is about 1,350 gallons. Now, remember, this brings into account things like taking showers, flushing toilets, washing clothes, um, uh, watering lawns, washing cars, uh, or the water use essentially used in making items or food that we use in everyday life. So what we actually need versus what we actually use is very, very different. Um, so there's a huge, as you can see here, right, there's a huge demand in many countries for there to be a lot of water available per individual. So in order to satisfy this demand for the water, why don't we use water found in rivers? So let's kind of think about this. Like a lot of times we do use water that's found in rivers, but many other times we actually will use water that is in the subsurface. So why would it be um, slightly challenging to use water from rivers to satisfy this huge demand of water for individuals? Well, one thing is that there's rivers, um, rivers aren't found everywhere. So rivers are essentially localized, right? They're only found in certain regions. So if you happen to live in an area where there's no rivers, you don't have a river to pull your water from. So we need to have another source. The other thing too, is that rivers don't flow all the time. Some rivers are seasonal, right? So you may be able to have those rivers flowing at certain times of the year, but they may not have water year round. Last but not least, right, you can also think that rivers can easily become contaminated, right? Rivers can become contaminated, especially by um, agricultural waste. It can be um, household waste or anything like that. And so because of these three reasons, it's actually a lot of times better or more convenient or even safer to use groundwater rather than surface water. So let's talk about where groundwater lives and also um, how much there is on the planet for us to access. You'll see in that animation on As You Learn that um, Earth's total water budget, if we talk about the total water budget on the planet here, 97% of the water on Earth is salt water and found in the ocean. So salt water means that it actually has some dissolved salts in it. Now the fresh water, the stuff that we drink and that we use for irrigation and everything like that, that's only about 3% of the total water on the planet, okay? So there's only about 3% of the water on the planet is fresh water. If we um, just look at that fresh water budget, if we just look at the 3% of water on Earth that is fresh water, so here's now the fresh water distribution, 70% of that almost is tied up in ice. Okay, 70% of that water is tied up in ice. And only about then 30% of that water is available as liquid water and it is in the groundwater. So here, if only 30% of our fresh water is groundwater, why is it so important? Why does it get its own lesson? Why aren't we doing an entire lesson on oceans? Or why aren't we doing an entire lesson on um, ice caps and glaciers? Well, they're important also, and we will be doing lessons on oceans and on ice caps and glaciers. But, but the important thing that we wanna talk about here is this disparity between groundwater being about 30% and surface water being less than about 1%. So of the fresh water on the planet, only about 1% lives in rivers and about 30% instead lives in groundwater. So it actually is a much larger um, reservoir of liquid fresh water on the planet. And so we do kind of focus here on uh, groundwater. If we then look at over um, up here, it's a, a massive, of the liquid fresh water, you know, groundwater is essentially about 94% of the liquid fresh water that we have on the planet. The other 6%, of course, would be the surface water, but it is also really important to use groundwater because here, groundwater can actually be protected during droughts. Where rivers might dry up during a seasonal drought or even a multi-year drought, groundwater is actually protected from the process of evaporation. Check out that animation on As You Learn, it'll show you a little bit more about this.
So even when surface water dries up, we can still have access to groundwater because groundwater doesn't react to droughts like surface water does. So it's, it's protected from evaporation, it's protected from droughts, and so it can be a really important resource when we're needing uh, critical uh, freshwater reservoirs. So where does groundwater live? Okay, we already talked about that groundwater, you know, based on its name, it lives in the ground, okay? So it can live in the Vado zone or it can live in the phreatic zone here. And remember, this boundary between the two is called the water table. But specifically, okay, yes, it lives in the ground, but where is it actually residing? Well, it's actually living in pore space. What is pore space? The pores are the spaces between solid grains found in the subsurface. This is a good example of seeing pore space. Okay, each of these little orange doohickeys, right, each of these little yellow things, this is a sediment grain. So you can imagine these are grains of sand or grains of soil or whatever else. And so they're solid, right? That's their little, you know, you can imagine that you have a barrel full of um, softballs, okay? The softballs, of course, are solid. But because these softballs aren't perfectly angular, they don't fit together perfectly. And so between the softballs, you have space. And the space between the softballs, or in this case, in between the grains, uh, this is called a pore. Okay, so that's the pore space. The pore space is where air or water can live. And so in specifically in the phreatic zone, right, where you have saturated conditions, all the pore space in the saturated zone would be filled with water. Now, there's a couple of things that can depict or that can depend on uh, how much porosity, how much pore space a certain rock unit might have. Notice that there is a decent amount of porosity in this rock unit, right? Maybe about 30%. And then notice this one instead. And notice that this one only has a porosity of about 15%. And this one's about 30%. Why does this one, do you think, have a higher porosity? Why is there more pore space in that one versus this one? What do you notice is different about the two? Okay, if you said that this one, the grains are all the same size and they don't fit together very well, but that in this one, the grains are all different sizes and they do fit together well, you're absolutely right, and that is something that we call sorting, okay? This rock unit up here, this is what we call well sorted, okay? All the grains are all the same size. This one down here is what we call poorly sorted. All the grains are different sizes. So if we're doing our analogy here, imagine that this one up top, this well sorted one, you would have a barrel full of softballs. This one down at the bottom, you could imagine you had a barrel full of basketballs, softballs, golf balls, and then sand. And so in a well-sorted barrel, right, where you have all softballs, you get a lot of pore space. In a barrel where you have basketballs, softballs, uh, golf balls, and then sand, notice that the sand and the smaller particles can fill in the pore spaces and so you essentially take up the pore space and you have a lower porosity. So sorting certainly plays a key in this. The other thing that plays an important role is just general grain size. The larger the grains are, right, a barrel full of basketballs, they won't fit together very well, but a really small grain size means that you can pack those grains very tightly together. So larger grain sizes, right, big grain sizes have a low, excuse me, I did that right the first time, larger grain sizes have a high porosity, lower or smaller grain sizes have a lower porosity, okay? So that has to do with both grain size and sorting. And as we go on to the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about something else that can affect the porosity of especially sedimentary rocks. Before we leave this slide, though, I wanna show, I draw your attention to one thing. This is a metamorphic rock. This is an igneous rock. Notice that both of them 
have essentially zero porosity. Both of them have interlocking crystals, and so it is very uh, unlikely to have porosity in an igneous or metamorphic rock. In fact, most metamorphic and igneous rocks have extremely low porosity unless they've been cracked or fractured. So if most porosity then tends to be found within sedimentary rocks, we already talked a little bit about how the sorting, right, the grain sorting, the uh, how do all of the grains uh, look like each other, uh, how that affects porosity. Here over here, this is your well sorted. This is your poorly sorted, right? So this would have a higher porosity. This would have a lower porosity. Another thing to remember, when we make sedimentary rocks, we need to put cement in between all the grains, right, to kind of glue them all together. Well, the cement takes up pore space. So a rock unit that has a lot of cement, right, a high percentage of cement means that it will have a low porosity. So if you have an uncemented sandstone, that will have a much higher porosity because there's no cement taking up the pore space. Now, I mentioned that most metamorphic rocks and igneous rocks have very, very little porosity, and so most porosity is found in sedimentary rocks. That is unless the rock becomes fractured. So fracturing essentially is just putting cracks, right? We're just going to crack the rock. Fracturing can add a porosity to the rocks, any kind of rock, igneous, metamorphic, or sedimentary, but it happens after the rock has already formed right? So you can have an igneous rock and it can have zero porosity, but a billion years later it can be cracked and fractured and then get a porosity due to those breaks, due to those fractures. So normally speaking, right, igneous and metamorphic rocks don't have a porosity unless they have been fractured. Now we often use these terms, right, porosity and permeability interchangeably, but they are actually quite different. So the, what is the difference then between porosity and permeability? We already said that the porosity, right, porosity is essentially just the number of holes, right, the hole space. The holes are the space between grains. Now, the permeability then is something different. The permeability is how connected are all of the holes because the permeability asks us how easy is it for a fluid to move through that material. So permeability now is, is not just implying whether something can hold water, it's whether something can have water flow through it. So here's an example in this top picture. Here's an example, okay, here's water living in the hole space. So this rock up here, rock number one, has a porosity, right? It does have a porosity because there are holes. Yep, porosity, check. There are holes and they are filled with water, but those holes are not connected. And so the water from essentially this hole can't flow over to this hole. So this is what we call an impermeable substance. In rock number two down here, not only does the rock have por uh, porosity, hole space, but the holes are connected by these little pathways that we call conduits, right? Those pathways are called conduits. So now water from here can flow along those conduits and go into a different pore. When you can get water flowing, that is when you create something that is permeable. So both of these rocks have porosity, but only rock number two is permeable. And it is permeable because it has those conduits to allow water to move in between different pores. So porosity and permeability are not the same thing. Remember, just because something has holes in it doesn't mean that it has to be permeable. Here's a good example of this, a cork Okay, a cork is porous, right? It has holes. In fact, a cork will float because it has so many holes in it, but a cork is not permeable. And you know that because if you have a bottle that has a cork in it and you turn it upside down, the wine doesn't pour out of your wine bottle. That's because the holes in the cork are not connected. So quiz question coming soon to a assignment near you. 
is porosity the same as permeability, right? That's a very hard no, because something can have holes, be porous, but not be permeable, right? They are not, the holes are not connected, and so there's no flow through a cork. When we talk about rock units, though, that are able to either move water, have permeability or not, right, rather than talking about corks and whatever else, we're going to talk about rock units that can uh, transmit water or cannot transmit water, and we're going to use terms called aquifers, aquitards, and aquacludes. If you know your uh, kind of, you know, root words here, you kind of know where we're going with this. An aquifer, right, an aquifer, think of transfer. Remember, aqua means water. So aquifers transmit or move water. So they are not only porous, but they are also permeable. So aquifers are able to transmit water. Now, an aquitard, okay, what does it mean if you're tardy, right? It means you're late, right? So you're, you're slow getting to class. So an aquitard is actually something that does transmit water, but it does so slowly. So it's not usually a very porous or very permeable unit, but it does have pores. Yes, we do have pores, and they are somewhat connected. Put somewhat connected, right? Because the transmission of water is relatively slow. Okay, and last but not least, if we think of, so aqua means water, right? What does clued mean? What does exclude mean? To keep out, right? So an aqua clued means that it does not transmit water at all. Now that can mean that it either has no porosity, so it either has no porosity or it has porosity but no permeability, right? It might have holes but the holes aren't connected so we can't get water to move through it. So now that we understand these three terms, Remember that now we can kind of translate that into what would it look like if we put those terms into practice and describe them in the subsurface. So let's imagine that now we have, here's our clouds, right? Their clouds are much prettier than mine, but that's okay. Here's our clouds and we're raining water. Water can then trickle down into the subsurface this way. And in an area where water is transmitted, and I know that this rock unit right here is transmitting water because notice that first the water comes down and then it starts to kind of flow. It kind of starts to move in my picture here to the right. This tells me that this rock unit up here is transmitting water, okay? So it is what we call an aquifer. And specifically, it is something that we call an unconfined aquifer because rainwater coming from clouds can directly get into this aquifer. There is nothing essentially above this to keep water out. It is an unconfined, right? There is nothing confining the top of this aquifer. So this top rock unit here, this is what we call an unconfined aquifer. It can immediately be recharged or um, the amount of water can be replenished directly from rainfall. Now let's go down to the bottom down here and look at rock number two. Look, I know that water is moving through this rock unit because I can see the arrows showing water movement. So I know that because water is moving through this, this is an aquifer, right? Water is transmitted, but notice what sits above this one. Notice that you have a, um, a what's called a confining unit. Notice that this confining unit has a low porosity and low permeability. So it is able to transmit water, but very slowly. Okay, so we're going to call that an aquitard. It transmits water, but very slowly. And so this down here, this aquifer, has a unit above it that is kind of keeping or slowing down water from getting into this aquifer. So the aquifer here in the bottom, number two here, this is what we call a confined aquifer. It cannot be directly replenished through rainwater because sitting on top of it, there is some sort of a rock unit that impedes the flow of water from getting into the units below.
Okay, so confined aquifers are not open directly to rainwater. They have some sort of a unit above them, okay, like this aqua, uh, aquitard right here, that slows down water getting back into that aquifer. So we're going to keep practicing and using these terms as we go on through the rest of the lesson. We uh, already discussed on the first slide that we have several different zones in the ground where water can live. The uppermost zone is called the Vados zone, and this is unsaturated, right, or under saturated with respect to water. And that means that there's still air, right? There's still air in the pore space here. Below that, usually deeper down in the subsurface, you have the phreatic zone where all of the pore space right, is filled with water and no air pockets remain. So this is what we call the saturated zone or the phreatic zone. The boundary between the two, right, the boundary between the vados zone and the phreatic zone is called the water table. Okay, so the boundary between the under saturated zone and the saturated zone is called the water table. And the water table fluctuates. Specifically, the water table fluctuates a lot, especially in places that have changes in um, climate or maybe annual rainfall. Here's what we mean when we say that the, the climate can affect the depth or the level of the water table. So in my image on the left here, let's imagine, um, it's kind of a grim image, but right here's our happy little cow, and uh, she's sitting at the edge of a nice little river. And that river, you'll notice that river is actually fed by groundwater because notice there's the water table, right? And remember that the water table tells us that this is the phreatic zone here, and then this little brown zone is the vados zone, right? And so our, you know, happy little clouds are just refilling here and they're keeping our water table up high enough so that where the land surface dips down, uh, my little cow, uh, we'll call her Betsy or whatever, right, has water to drink in this surface river. Now, notice that if we go over here, it has stopped raining. And so we assume that now the climate, uh, you know, maybe this is like a drought or something like this, right? And again, it's grim because let's just say Bessie's taking a nap, right? She's not, she's not feeling too good. Um, the, uh, the water table here has dropped significantly, mainly because in periods of drought over long periods of time, if that aquifer is not replenished by rainwater, the water table will drop and in this scenario what has happened is is that the water table has dropped enough to where it can no longer feed the river um, that we had in uh, panel one over here right so normally groundwater is relatively protected but over long periods of drought the water table can and will drop and you can actually see that surface rivers will eventually dry up um, here's a pop quiz real quick. If this is over here, if this is an aquifer that is being directly replenished by rainwater, is this a confined aquifer or an unconfined aquifer? This over here, right, would be an unconfined aquifer. Does that make sense? Specifically because it is uh, open to being replenished by direct rainfall. Now, uh, we're showing this as almost like an immediate response, right? That if you have uh, a drought, that the groundwater will almost drop immediately. Um, and I think that that's a little bit of a, of a misnomer in this picture, especially when they're using the cow here. Um, it doesn't, the groundwater doesn't react immediately to changes in rainfall. In fact, there's kind of usually a little bit of lag time. If you look at the diagram up here, right, this is time in a year, right? So January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Notice that the top red line is rainfall, okay? So when rainfall hits its highest peak, right, in kind of May to June, that the water table doesn't reach its highest level until almost about a month later. Right, so the highest level in the water table is actually after the highest level in rainfall. And that's because it does take a long time for water to rain out onto the surface, sink into the subsurface, and then add to any unconfined aquifers.
So just remember that, you know, even though we can recharge these uh, aquifers by rainfall, it doesn't happen immediately because it takes a long time for water to sink into the subsurface. I want to introduce a concept now called hydraulic head. Um, and essentially here, what we're going to talk about is that the water table is not at the same level everywhere in the subsurface. Notice that over here, this kind of dashed blue line, this is supposed to show the water table, okay? Notice that the water table is actually at a higher elevation beneath a hill and is actually at a lower elevation underneath this valley. That is what's called the hydraulic head. The hydraulic head is essentially the elevation, right? The position or elevation of the water table above some reference horizon, right? So it could be above sea level, could be above, you know, whatever, some data point, some reference point. And so uh, this uh, water table right here, H1 is the location or elevation of the water table underneath the hill and H2 is the elevation of the water table as we get down the slope a bit. So this is a hydraulic head one and this is hydraulic head two. You can see where I'm going with this, right? Do you guys remember that from any time you have a graph, right? And you have a point and you have another point, you can calculate the slope because it's the change in X over ch change in Y over change in X, right? So it's the rise over the run. You can figure out the slope. Well, we can do the same thing with hydraulic head you can figure out what's the change in the hydraulic head over a certain distance, and that is called the hydraulic gradient. So rates of groundwater flow are variable, significantly variable. In fact, uh, you'll notice down here, uh, groundwater flow rates can range from four meters a year to 500 meters a year. So if you have you know, this kind of idea of recharge, this is replenishing an unconfined aquifer here. You can have the recycling of groundwater happen, you know, very, very quickly, moving 500 meters or, you know, half a kilometer in a year, or some of that water can actually sink down into the subsurface and it moves painfully slowly to the point where you only get four meters of movement of water per year. All right, four meters is roughly, you know, 12 feet or, more, or so. So you can imagine that that is extremely slow, slow movement of water. So this slow movement of water means that the change in hydraulic head doesn't happen very rapidly. It can, over, in fact, actually be relatively uh, slow. So here's this idea of hydraulic gradient. Oh no, I've been I've been Bill Gates. That's okay. This uh, this image over here. Whenever I I'm working on a Mac, and so whenever I draw a symbol and then it gets changed into something other than the symbol I made it as, I always say that I've been Bill Gates. It's not that I don't like Bill Gates. He's wonderful. But okay, I wanted to change that to make sure. The flow rate, okay, so the rate that the water moves through an aquifer depends on the permeability of the actual aquifer, right? So, and remember, what affects the permeability? That's the connectedness of the pores, right? Connected pores. Well, it can also essentially depend on the slope, and the slope is essentially the change in the hydraulic gradient, the change in the hydraulic head between two points. The change in the hydraulic head between two points is the hydraulic gradient. That's what this is. This is just a fancy way of writing the change in elevation, right? The delta H is the change in height over distance, right? Divided by distance. This is, this is the same thing as you're, you're calculating the rise over the run, right? The change in elevation over distance. So you're calculating essentially the slope of this line between two different hydraulic heads. It's the change in elevation over distance. And so we call that value, that change in, change in head over distance, we call that the hydraulic gradient. So this is supposed to be a capital Greek D, this is delta. And that delta stands for change in H, change in height, over some distance. So that's how we could calculate, if we wanted to, we could calculate the hydraulic gradient and figure out essentially how fast the flow would be um, in a, in a uh, aquifer. Uh, 
Once we know the hydraulic gradient, and unfortunately my value got changed again here, here's that delta symbol again, right? That should be that capital Greek delta and the same here. Once we know the hydraulic gradient, ooh, that's getting ugly. Once we know the hydraulic gradient, we can calculate something called discharge. Discharge over here as value Q, this is the volume of water. Okay, this is the volume of water moving through an aquifer. We call that the discharge. Discharge is really important to know. If you ever buy a home and you are on well water, you are going to want to know what is the discharge of that well. Because if you have, for example, my first house in um, Ash County, I had six people, uh, six households were pulling off the same well. And so I needed to know what was the discharge on that well because with six houses pulling on that well, you wanted to know what was the flow rate? Was the amount of water flowing through that well in that aquifer enough to satisfy the demands of six households wanting to take a shower every morning or cook dinner in the evening? So discharge is the volume of water over time. And so a lot of times you'll see this as like, you know, gallons per minute, right? This is flow rate. We can figure out the flow rate, right? This discharge. If we know, first of all, the hydraulic gradient, okay, so that's this variable right here. That's the change in height over distance of the aquifer. So if we know the hydraulic gradient and we know the area over which the water is going to flow, so literally, right, what is the area of the aquifer? Or for your household, you might want to know what's the area of your well pipe. And one last variable. The last variable you need to know is the K constant here, which is essentially a, a, a conductivity measurement. That is the permeability of the aquifer, right? This is the aquifer that the water is flowing through. So the volume of water over time is equal to the area over which the water is flowing, the slope or the gradient, right, over which the water is flowing, and the permeability of the aquifer that is trying to transmit all that water. So hopefully this makes a little bit of sense. And this is calculating something that we call hydraulic conductivity. Think of something that is a good conductor, right? It's able to move um, uh, uh, electricity or something. Well, this is where we're talking about moving water, it's hydraulic conductivity. And this equation that we're calculating here, this Q equation here is called Darcy's law. Um, it was originally developed to figure out how to develop sewage lines uh, underneath the city of London. So how could you actually set up pipes with uh, sand in them to move uh, wastewater around the city of London? But of course, it works just as well for calculating the discharge, the volume of water moving through uh, aquifers in the subsurface. This just kind of puts it into practice that I know I've shown you the equation for Darcy's law and we're showing it again down here, right? Here's Darcy's law, but here's how you could actually figure this out in a problem associated with an actual real world aquifer. Let's imagine that you have, this is a this is the water table right here, right? So this is the Vado zone and the phreatic zone. And you have two wells well A and well B, and you've put those wells in so that you know the elevation of the water table at both of those wells. So you now know this variable because you know the hydraulic head, right, the elevation of the water table in well A. It's 440 meters above sea level. And you know the hydraulic head the elevation of the water table in well B. It is 415 meters above sea level. And remember, you know over what distance that change in hydraulic head is because you can essentially measure the distance between well A and well B. What this then does is we can set up our discharge equation so that Q is equal to 440 minus 415, right? That's your change in hydraulic head over the distance. We would have to measure this distance here. I don't know if we have the distance given on here. Well, that's not very nice. It didn't even give us the distance. Over the distance, okay? And you would multiply that by the area, 
what's the area? Here's the cross-sectional area of well B, right? That's what we would want to know. We would plug that in for A, and you would also need to know the conductivity of whatever this aquifer is down here. You could do that and then plug it in to figure out what would be the amount of discharge coming out of well B over some certain amount of time. I'm not going to have you guys actually calculate this, but I do want you to know where some of these numbers come from because we're going to be using this when we talk about <clears throat> groundwater in lab next week. So in the Vados zone, water moves downward by percolation. And remember that we talked about last week, percolation just means water not moving in a straight line. Okay, so water kind of does this, this uh, circuitous path as it's moving through the subsurface, and we call that movement percolation. So percolation only happens in the Vados zone because water is, uh, the, the, the water here is undersaturated, and so you're just kind of moving around particles as you are being pulled downwards by gravity. The flow of groundwater, however, in the saturated zone is different. So now we're in the saturated zone. We're not talking about percolation in the Vados zone, that's all these little arrows right here, right? That's percolation in the Vados zone. Now let's talk about how water flows beneath the water table. I can guarantee you that this is gonna come up on a, on a quiz or an exam sometime soon. In uh, the saturated zone, water does not feel pressure from overlying rock. So the water sitting down here, right, in this aquifer, isn't feeling pressure from all the rock that's around it. Instead, the water in the saturated zone feels pressure from two things. One, gravity, right? Gravity wants to pull that water down. And two, it feels the pressure from overlying water. Not overlying rock, but overlying water. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's look at this um, uh, graph, this image real quick at the bottom, and let's talk about recharge and discharge. Areas that get a lot of rainfall are what we call recharge areas. A recharge area is where uh, rainwater can actually replenish, so think replenish and recharge, groundwater aquifers. So it's places, recharge places are where you get a lot of rainfall and you're going to add water to the saturated zone. So lots of water raining on hills means that essentially that is a recharge area right here. You have tons and tons of water being pumped into the groundwater system here in these hills. That means that the water table underneath hills is relatively high because you're constantly pumping in more and more water because you're getting more and more rainfall coming in as recharge. So underneath hills, the water table sits up relatively high. Underneath valleys, however, right, in regions where you have valleys like this, you don't get as much rainwater. So these are areas that we call discharge areas, places where water tends to pop out of the ground, not go back into the ground. So discharge areas are usually found in places where there is uh, low topography, and the water in these discharge regions, water here is at a lower hydraulic head, right? Water here is at a lower hydraulic head than water up here. So water at H2 is feeling pressure from water that is at higher elevations, so from the water at hydraulic head number one. Water at hilltops wants to flow down thanks to gravity. As it wants to flow down and push outwards, it exerts a pressure on water at lower elevation, and then that water at lower elevation wants to find a way to get out. That's why water at discharge areas tends to kind of pop out in either springs or rivers or something like that. So there is a high water table under recharge areas, it presses down on water at lower areas, and in those discharge regions, the water emerges due to the pressure of overlying water. 
Just remember that you could annotate this whole graph with all the stuff that we've been learning on previous slides, right? This is where you have recharge, water level, water table is high, that's hydraulic head number one. This is water level at a different level over here. This is a different hydraulic uh, head over here. You could calculate the hydraulic gradient over the two, but specifically what we wanna know is that the water at these lower um, water table elevations is feeling pressure from water at higher elevations elsewhere in the aquifer. It's not feeling pressure from any overlying rock. It's the water in the system acting independently and causing that water to pop out as a discharge zone. Okay, so where water tends to come out remember is what we call discharge. So water coming out of the ground surface is called a discharge zone. When you put a well, if you drill a well down into the subsurface, right? When you put a well into the subsurface and you puncture an unconfined aquifer, what will happen is that the water level in the well will rise and match the water table in that aquifer, okay? So remember, this is an unconfined aquifer, which means that it is being directly recharged from rainwater, right? So this water can kind of sink right back down into and replenish this unconfined aquifer. So in an unconfined aquifer, which can openly be recharged from direct rainfall, if we put in a well and pierce an unconfined aquifer, the water level in that well will be the same level as the water table in the aquifer. So notice that if I erase all my scribbles over here in this well, see this little weird symbol here, this little upside down triangle? The upside down triangle is a symbol for water table. And notice that the upside down triangle here for the water table in the aquifer and the water table in the well, they are equivalent. So anytime you put a well into an unconfined aquifer, the water table in the well will be equal to the water table in the aquifer. Now, this is different when you put in a well that pierces a confined aquifer. Let's remind ourselves what's a confined aquifer. A confined aquifer sits below a confining unit, which means too that the confined aquifer is not directly recharged from rainwater. If we put in a well, right, if we put in a well and that well pierces a confined aquifer, the water level in the well does not have to be the same level as the water in the confined aquifer. In fact, in this diagram, you'll notice that the water table is actually well above. The water table in the well is well above the level of water in the confined aquifer. That is because water in a confined aquifer is feeling pressure, right? It's feeling pressure from all the other water in the system. And that pressure usually not always, but usually pushes some of the water in the well to a higher elevation than the water that is in the aquifer. Because of this, okay, because of the pressure, the water in the well will sit at a different level than the water in the aquifer. The water that is in the well will reach what's called the potentiometric surface. Okay, let's just write that out here, the potentiometric, potentiometric surface. So that's the, the potential level of water that this aquifer could reach if you released all the pressure from all of the other water in the system. So we're gonna use potentiometric surface in a second, but just remember, the potentiometric surface has to do with when you put a well in a confined aquifer and it is that the water in a confined aquifer is feeling a lot of pressure, and so the water level in the well does not have to match the level of water in the aquifer itself. 
Here's an example of how we can use the potentiometric surface. And don't laugh at my funny little drawing, but um, uh, it'll, it'll show you kind of how this potentiometric surface comes into play. This down here, this is a confined aquifer, right? And this is an unconfined aquifer. So if we put a well, right? If we put a well into an unconfined aquifer, what happens? The water level in the well is equal to the water table in the unconfined aquifer. Good? Okay, that one's easy. Now let's put wells, let's put well number one and well number two, but now we're gonna pierce the confined aquifer. The water level in well one and two is going to reach not just the water level in the confined aquifer, it's gonna reach, remember, the potentiometric surface of the confined aquifer. Remember, this water is under pressure, right? So the water in well number one is now at the water level of the potentiometric surface. This is a well now, though, that needs to be pumped. So it's a non-flowing, artesian what's called an artesian well an artesian well means that the water level sits well above the water table but it's a non-flowing artesian well because the top of the well pipe sits above the water level so you would still have to pump the water up here to get it out but now let's look at well two well two is very different because well two pierces the confined aquifer but the top of well two sits below the potentiometric surface. Remember, all the water in this well wants to get up to this potentiometric surface, but the top of the well sits below the potentiometric surface. That means this well will actually flow without pumping. We call that a flowing artesian well. You literally wouldn't even have to put a pump on this well. As long as the water continued to try to reach the potentiometric surface, that well would continue to produce water. This is just a reminder down here too that here's our definition of the potentiometric surface. It's an imaginary surface defined by the level to which water in an aquifer would rise due to the natural pressure in the confined aquifer. If you live in a town where there is a water tower, and in fact, if you drive to App Campus and you come through Wilkesboro, they just put a brand new water tower next to 421 uh, at the intersection of 421 and 16. Uh, the water tower is actually a really good use of the potentiometric surface. If you ever wondered what a water tower is and why they do what they do with a water tower, essentially what they do is they take a huge volume of water and they put it at a high elevation, right? That's all a water tower is, is it's this huge bulb, right? And it's filled with water. What they're doing is they're putting water at a high elevation. What that then does is if they connect pipes, right? Oh, that's the wrong pipe. If they connect pipes to this um, water tower, they've created a potentiometric surface by putting this water at a high elevation. By then connecting pipes to that water, you'll essentially set up a flowing artesian situation so now the water can actually flow into all of your houses just by putting this water at higher elevation and exerting pressure on the rest of the water in the system. This also explains too why if you live very close to the water tower versus if you live farther away, you'll have great water pressure if you're really close to the water tower and not so great water pressure if you're farther away. Because notice the potentiometric surface actually decreases slightly in elevation as you go farther and farther away from the water tower. So this is using the same principle of an artesian well, is that if you put the pipes essentially in your house so that the pipe top 
is below the potentiometric surface created by the water tower. Every time you turn on the faucet, water will flow because this is a flowing artesian well situation, just like it is in the natural situation, we're setting it up so that it works the same way in your municipality. This also happens in, in nature. In fact, if you've ever seen springs, these are discharge zones or seeps or uh, groundwater fed wetlands or things like that. And I used to have a, boy, before I uh, worked at Appalachian, I had a whole career working on uh, springs and freshwater seeps. Um, wherever you see a natural spring, and we have a bunch of them down here in Wilkes County, this is the same thing that's happening too, right? You've actually got groundwater that's trying to flow towards the surface and you either have created a, uh, a crack, right? There's a fault, or you've got bedding planes or fractures, right, between the uh, rocks here. And so you're creating a pathway, right? You're creating a conduit for water to flow out and to create a discharge zone. And when it does, we call these springs. So we can create springs in a bunch of different ways. Uh, you can do it when bedding planes, right? When bedding planes intersect a slope, uh, this one's showing where a fault allows the water to come back up. This one's using a joint. This one is actually showing that the water table just sits at a high elevation and because the slope of the land cuts through the water table, you'll actually just get uh, seeps coming down this way. Um, things get a little bit more confusing with the guys over here, so we can ignore those for now. But um, these are just some examples of how you can get discharge zones called springs. And here's some examples of what these springs look like. This was when I used to work out in Pilot Valley, Nevada. This is my friend Ryan for scale, but um, this is actually back here, this whole big desert. This is the Bonneville Salt Flats. And you'll, I mean, it's just a straight salt desert, but there's this beautiful lush vegetation because this is one of those discharge zones where water is popping out underneath of, uh, above a fault. Um, Ryan's pointing to it up here, but you can't really tell, but you notice right in here, this is actually like bubbles there the the water in the, the that's discharging out of the spring is bubbling out so fast that the sand almost looks like it's boiling it's not it's cool to the touch but it the amount of water being pumped out of the spring is so rapid i mean you're talking you know tens to hundreds of gallons per minute that this sand was actually kind of bubbling and moving and and, and roiling here and it made it almost look like it was a hot spring but it's not so these discharge zones happen in a lot of different regions and in arid zones these are really important places where you can get water okay why don't you take a break this is a good spot we're almost at an hour so take a break and if you want to you can come back and then we'll talk about now the problems with using groundwater as well as the um, possibilities of contaminating groundwater all right so we are back all right, now I want to talk a little bit about how we use and sometimes misuse groundwater. So the first thing I want to talk about is what happens to the water table when we start to put in all these wells and start to pump water out of an unconfined aquifer. Let's set up a scenario here where you've got a, uh, an agricultural uh, situation, right? So you've got your agricultural fields over here and you have the farmhouse sitting here. Now you've put in a small well on this side for uh, home use and you put in a much larger well over here and that larger well is mainly to irrigate your fields. So what happens when you start to pump water out of uh, wells, and remember both of these wells now are piercing an unconfined aquifer, what happens when you start to pump on these wells is that the water table is going to start to drop. Notice the level of the water table right now at both of these wells. Notice now though, once we pump on these wells, you're actually going to start to drop the water table around the wells. You're going to essentially see what's called drawdown, right? You're at, the water table will be drawn down around the wells be, because you're pumping out, you're pulling water out of this region very quickly right to irrigate your fields or to use to wash clothes in your house and the flow of water to replenish the water that you pulled out is much too slow so we're pulling water out much faster than we're letting water flow back in what this creates then this whole idea of drawdown 
creates a feature that you can't really see in two dimensions here. It's called a cone of depression, right? This cone of depression is actually in like 3D, right? So it would actually go back into the aquifer this way and then kind of come out the screen towards me this way, that all the water in the system, everything around is actually now being drawn down towards this well. So if you looked at this from the top, right, we're looking at a, at a side view right here. If you're looking at a side view, if you were looking at a, a, a view of this from the top, like from space directly down, you would actually see that the level of water around this well has dropped in almost a bullseye pattern. This can become really serious when you have wells that are pumping too much and the uh, level of water, the drawdown associated with that well regionally drops the entire water table so much so that now notice we've pumped so much on this irrigation well over here, we've dropped the water table of the entire area so that now our home well has actually gone dry. We've dropped the water table everywhere in this aquifer, and now this well can no longer reach water. So there are major issues associated with pumping and sometimes over pumping um, with some of these wells using too much water uh, at a rate that is much faster than the water can replenish and build back up this way to, um, to increase the water table. Uh, you can also actually completely reverse the flow of groundwater by over pumping. How do we do this? <clears throat> Here's a good situation. Okay, so we're going to write up here. I'm going to put it in green. This is actually good agriculture. This is good planning right here. In this scenario, notice that groundwater is flowing to the left. Okay, this is the well right here that supplies the home with drinking water. And this is the home's septic tank. Now, if you can't remember what a septic tank is, this is where all of the household waste goes. Notice that someone has actually done a good job here because the water in the area is going to the left, which means that any sort of waste coming from the septic tank is going away from the home water well. This is a good situation. Okay, now, Let's look at the scenario down here, and I'm going to put not good. Let's imagine that we have the same scenario, but what has happened is now we've put in another well. We've put in a well to irrigate the local fields. That well is much larger than the well associated with home use. So what's happened, notice here, is that we have significant drawdown on the irrigation well We've actually made this well um, have trouble getting to the water, but notice what we've done. We've completely changed the regional flow of groundwater. The flow of groundwater was moving to the left, right, in scenario one, but because we're pumping so much on this large irrigation well, all the water now wants to go towards that well and what that means is the contaminant plume is now going right into the home's water supply so we reverse the direction of groundwater flow and we've apparently uh, or potentially made people very very sick because now you've got all the waste from the septic system getting into the home water supply these are major issues that um, anybody who wants to build a home where you're not on city water or if you have a septic system, uh, definitely you will want to employ an environmental geologist or an environmental scientist to help you figure out these problems. Another way that we can actually affect the groundwater flow direction is on coastal regions. So imagine that right now on, in scenario one, you have fresh water over here and salt water over here. Now they can both be in the subsurface and actually underneath the ocean, you do have salty groundwater, but fresh water is actually less dense than salty water. And so the fresh water kind of sits on top of the salty groundwater, right? So here's the fresh water sits as like a cap on top of the salty groundwater. Now let's move to scenario two and imagine that we put in a bunch of homes in the coastal region. Those homes are gonna need water. So we put in a well 
and we start to now pump fresh water into the well to support all of those homes. Well, what can eventually happen is two things. One, we're gonna create drawdown around the well, right? We're gonna drop the water table. And the other thing that's gonna happen is if we pull in too much water into the well, faster than the fresh water in the aquifer can replenish it, what's gonna happen is that salt water from underneath is also going to start to get into the well and you'll get what's called salt water intrusion. Uh, if you have ever been on the Outer Banks after a pretty decent hurricane or storm, and, and you notice that a lot of people who have well water on the Outer Banks, their water tastes a little bit salty afterward, after a really big storm, that's because of saltwater intrusion. It's a little bit different. That's where storm water is actually kind of washing over this way, and it kind of sits in the aquifer before the saltwater sinks through. But it is the same idea of saltwater intrusion into the aquifer. That's by stormwater, but you can also get it too, where if you pump too much, you can actually start to now suck up the salt water that is sitting below the fresh water in the water table. They're having big problems with this right now in uh, Florida coastal regions and also on the um, coastal plain of North Carolina, places like New Bern, um, Aurora, uh, all those places there because they are uh, putting in really big paper mill plants and paper plants are actually really, really water intensive. So what they're doing is they're pumping a lot of groundwater from the coastal aquifers there, and they're starting to see problems with saltwater intrusion. Here's another problem with pumping groundwater. <clears throat> In our scenario one up here, we have a, a aquifer, and the aquifer is so full of water that all the pore space is full of water, so much so that it is actually helping to keep the grains apart. So the pressure of the water found in the pore spaces here actually pushes the grains apart so the grains aren't touching each other. If we put in a well, right, and we start to now pump water out of that aquifer, what will happen over time is we are going to now pump out the water that was sitting in the pore spaces and the pores are going to start to collapse. As the pores collapse, the aquifer is actually going to subside or sink. The aquifer is actually going to get thinner. And what happens is the ground surface is actually going to start to sink down. This is called subsidence, right? The ground surface is going to sink and subside, and you're going to see cracks and fissures developing at this surface. One big place where we see this happening right now is in California. Um, Silicon Valley and everything like that, places where we are using a ton of groundwater to irrigate uh, or to use it for um, uh, computer production, we are actually uh, collapsing a lot of the subsurface aquifers and you're seeing big problems with subsidence of the land. Here's a good example of what this subsidence looks like. Here's the San Joaquin Valley in California. And this is showing, this is where the land surface was in 1925. This is where the land surface was in 1955. This is where the land surface was in 1977. It's had nine meters of subsidence due to pumping in the aquifer over about 50 years. That's pretty significant. So this is literally the land surface has dropped nine meters because the aquifer underneath the San Joaquin Valley is actually collapsing because we're pumping out so much groundwater. Uh, another example of this, a popular example, is the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? When the Leaning Tower of Pisa was actually built, it, it was straight, it was upright, um, but, uh, uh, compaction of uh, the sediment underneath one side of it due to groundwater flow has actually caused it to start to lean. So lots of big problems associated with pumping and over pumping. Um, and there's one thing that we kind of have to think about is, you know, what can we do in our everyday lives so that we're not using so much fresh water, so that the demand for that groundwater isn't so great that we're constantly always pumping it out of the ground. 
there are, of course, you know, conservation efforts. And I know that you guys do a lot of these, right? You can, uh, you know, turn the water off when you brush your teeth. You can actually turn the water off while you shower. Um, a lot of people will do this. They'll get wet, turn the water off, soap up, and then turn the water back on to rinse. Um, when I do, I do a lot of my research in Africa and I get a three gallon shower bag for every week. So three gallons of water to shower with every week. So that's roughly, you know, I can take a shower in about one gallon of water, but that's turning it on, just barely getting wet, soaping up and then rinsing off. So imagine having one milk jug, right? One gallon of water every other day to take a shower. Uh, that's, it's pretty challenging, but it's certainly doable. Uh, and then now think about too, how different it is when you take a shower here at home and how much water is actually used for that. Um, we're doing better, of course, right, with our individual efforts, and we're learning how to be better irrigators using, um, you know, better practices for maybe not watering lawns or watering fields during the middle of the day when most of the water evaporates, instead doing it in the cooler evenings or mornings. Um, but we're also coming up with plans, too, where we can actually share water, right, interbasinal water transfers, where, you know, if you have a city that has water versus a city that doesn't have water, you can actually truck it and share it between um, two uh, different basins. The implications of this are actually a little bit tricky though, because you can imagine if water becomes a commodity, then those who have it are going to set the prices for those who don't have it, and that can become a very tricky situation. The other thing too is that um, we are working on, and it's still extremely expensive and not very efficient, but we are working on desalination. That is the process by which you take salt water and make it into fresh water. So California and lots of other places are working on this where they are trying to take large volumes of salt water, remove the salt, and then make fresh water out of it. Now we're getting better. It is still though very expensive and not very efficient, but we're still working on the, the, whole, um, the whole process and eventually going to make it a lot more efficient. So we've talked at length now about what groundwater is, where it lives, um, and how important it is to everyday life, whether it be for individuals, businesses, um, farmers, whatever else. But I wanna talk about um, a problem that is pretty ubiquitous, pretty everywhere, and it's groundwater contamination. Um, every country is having a problem with groundwater contamination, and, it, um, you know, and the US is certainly not immune to that. Yeah, so in a few minutes, I'm going to kind of show you what are different types of contaminants. And then I'll show you a situation, a really bad situation that we had here in the U.S. in a place called Woburn, Massachusetts, that was popularized by the book and then the movie A Civil Action. Okay, so groundwater contamination. <clears throat> when water rains on the soil the water percolates through the soil and eventually gets into the groundwater. Now that's a good thing because soil can actually act as a filter. So it will filter out some suspended materials, right? Uh, you know, waste or particles or whatever else. And so the, the fluid goes back into the groundwater, but the particles, the contaminant particles can sometimes stay in the soil. That's a good thing. The problem, though, is that if there are any chemicals dissolved in the water, they can't be filtered out by the soil. And what will happen is those dissolved chemicals and even some non-soluble chemicals, right, things that are uh, not mixable with water like oil, they can actually then go with the water down into the groundwater system and then we have a problem. Any substance, any substance that makes groundwater unusable is what we would call groundwater contamination. So even things that you think of as regular, like, you know, daily things that we eat and drink every day in high enough quantities can become a groundwater contaminant. Salt can become a groundwater contaminant because at high levels, we can't drink that, right? It makes it unusable. Uh, copper, we take, you know, copper is in your multivitamins, but if copper is at too high of a level, it of course then becomes a contaminant. So even very small quantities of contaminants can make groundwater unusable. And such small quantities that we're actually gonna talk about things like parts per million or parts per thousand. 
So we're going to measure concentrations of some of our contaminants in ppm. This stands for parts per million. If something is one ppm, that means say you have one part per million copper contaminant in water, that means that for every one million water molecules, you have one molecule of copper, okay? So many cutoffs for non-toxic chemicals are gonna be in the 500 to 1,000 parts per million. Many toxic chemicals have extremely low tolerance values, right? 0.1 part per million will consider a volume of water a contaminant. And so what are we talking about in terms of contaminants? We're gonna talk about things like you know, gas stations or uh, subsurface oil tanks. Um, dry cleaners are notorious for contaminating groundwater and things like that. So um, let's look at some of these contaminants and their concentrations. So many contaminants are natural, right? So salt is a contaminant, sulfur, iron, right? And believe it or not, it doesn't take all that much for you to start to notice whether something is contaminated with salt. 100 parts per million, so 100 salt uh, ions for 1 million water molecules will make something start to taste salty. So, um, and a lot of these are actually gonna have a much lower contamination level, but um, many contaminants are natural and they are occurring just in you know, the natural environment. And of course, some of them are unnatural and human activity is certainly not helping. Human activity, of course, increases the likelihood that um, surface and groundwater can be contaminated because of you know, dumping trash like as you're seeing here or runoff of fertilizer or um, other types of contaminants. Happy little graphic from an intro textbook, right? Showing all sorts of contamination sources that could be getting into the groundwater system. So if you think about you know, your, just your normal daily household, here would be your household and this would be your septic tank. So your septic tank is holding house water, household waste and that eventually does get into the groundwater system. If you're talking about larger farms, right, you can get retention ponds, places where they hold animal sewage, that can eventually sink down into the subsurface. And so can the fertilizers and pesticides that we put on the fields. All of that can eventually get down into the subsurface and contaminate groundwater. Landfills are a big problem, and well, they used to be a big problem. They're not as bad now, but uh, landfills, you can get the um, contamination of all of the garbage that's decomposing. It can get down into the groundwater system. Gas stations and gas tanks, uh, storage tanks, waste containers, right? Here's like radioactive waste from some sort of industry. And then another big thing too is mining, getting a lot of the um, contaminants associated with materials that we are mining, that stuff eventually gets down into the groundwater. So um, different sources, not every place is gonna have the same source, of course, but in some regions, they can be certainly pretty dramatic. Groundwater contamination, I love it. Here's another intro textbook diagram. Let's not pump straight pollutant into the groundwater. Let's assume that this is actually a natural situation, like maybe your septic tank, right? But either way, the pink here would be in your septic tank. And what happens is, is that as that actually then gets into the groundwater system, Vedov zone, phreatic zone here, right? nearest to the source of the contaminant, you will have a very high concentration of your contamination. In all directions though, going away from your contaminant source, you will start to now have kind of a diffusion or a dilution of that contaminant so that values out here are going to be much lower concentrations than values in here nearest to the kind of the, the highest concentration in the plume. So you'll notice that the water flow, the groundwater in this system is flowing this way. So the contaminant is kind of being pulled along in the groundwater system like this. And so you're gonna get lower and lower concentrations as you go out from the source of the contaminant plume. I wanna to talk to you now about certain types of contamination and uh, every good environmental scientist or every good uh, environmental geologist will need to know about this because 
these are things that you know the EPA keeps track of or things that if you are looking at the quality of water in your well for your house and we get this actually published every year for the water quality at App State uh, you need to know about the types of contaminants that could be affecting your water supply okay the first one I want to talk about are these things that are called dissolved compounds okay you can also call these aqueous phase liquids or aqueous phase compounds that means that these are things that can dissolve in water now the safe drinking water act directs the epa to establish maximum contaminant levels for water supplies for dissolved compounds things like copper lead and mercury those are things that would be found naturally in the environment these are not natural okay these things are um, man-made they are synthetic contaminants but the big problem is is that they dissolve in water so they're very hard to remove right and um, notice that the contamination levels these are the maximum contamination levels ah these are supposed to say micrograms this is supposed to say microgram um, but that's okay uh, these are the maximum contamination levels right the mcl's maximum contamination levels um, notice that some of these are you know extremely low right two micrograms per liter that every microgram is 10 to the minus six grams. So really, really, really small values of things like TCE, PCE, vinyl chloride, and benzene. These are really big industrial chemicals that a lot of um, uh, machines are cleaned with. And then of course, uh, when those machines are then um, uh, either discarded or disposed of, a lot of those chemicals can get into the groundwater. Dissolved compounds, are carried along in the groundwater as it moves it's really really hard to get dissolved compounds out of the groundwater because they're literally dissolved in it right you would actually have to separate the dissolved compound from the water in the contaminated aquifer so these are dissolved compounds imagine that you've got for example right here would be a landfill so you can have like a you know a mountain of trash right sitting over here here's your landfill and this would then be the contaminant plume this stuff would then get dissolved and would move down gradient with the groundwater flow of course if you live nearby right and your well is pulling groundwater then of course you're going to get that contaminant plume right up into your home well so this has been a problem in places massachusetts um, in places like love canal um, new york and whatever else places where they had um, uh schools and uh residential homes that were actually pulling water from a contaminant plume like this now we're going to look at now the next group of compounds this is two these are immiscible compounds that means these don't mix with water okay so they are immiscible which means that they don't dissolve in water and there's two kinds of immiscible compounds the first one I want to look at are called Dean apples, dense non aqueous phase liquids. <laughs> I know it's weird. So these are called Dean apples. And the important part of, is up front is the D. These are dense, which means that when they get into an aquifer, they sink to the bottom. Okay. So let's imagine that you have a, a contaminant, right? Here's a barrel of Dean apple and the con contaminant gets into the uh the aquifer right here's the water table what will happen is is that that contaminant will sink to the bottom of the aquifer because it's dense right and if it's possible it will find cracks even in the bedrock beneath the aquifer and will slowly start to sink down and really get deep into the aquifer and that makes it really really difficult to almost impossible to clean this stuff up so they're heavier than water uh, things like tce and tca actually they have a specific gravity that's higher than water remember specific gravity of water is one so um, they have a higher specific gravity than water so they are dean apples they are dense non-aqueous phase liquids they sink to the bottom of the aquifers and it's really hard to get this stuff out the other type of immiscible compound is L napples and of course these are now light non aqueous phase liquids we call these light because they are less dense than water and so they float 
These are much easier to clean. And these are things like gasoline and diesel fuel. We don't ever want these things to get into the groundwater system, but when they do, they tend to kind of sit in a plume up on top of the water table. And what that means is we can kind of skim them or we can kind of um, get underneath them into the aquifer here and push them out wells this way. They are a little easier to clean because they float, but again, you know, none of these contaminants are actually good. So I wanna take just a couple of minutes here before we end and tell you about a case study in Woburn, Massachusetts, where this happened in um, the late 60s through the 1980s and they noticed that the residents of Woburn, Massachusetts were starting to see a lot of cases of childhood leukemia. So the fatalities were due to leukemia. There were eight families that noticed this, seven children died and one adult. And they decided that they were gonna investigate that maybe the problem was coming from the local groundwater. The plaintiffs, right, those eight families claimed that the culprit was contamination in the groundwater from three large local companies, okay? They sued three large local companies and there was a huge investigation associated with this, went on for many, many years. Um, and eventually what they did find out was that yes, there was huge contamination of like, you know, TCE and vinyl chloride and TCA and all that sort of stuff from these companies that was getting into the groundwater of Woburn, Massachusetts. I don't expect you to memorize all this. I don't expect you to um, to kind of you know spend too much time, but I just want to read this to you quickly so that you kind of understand the scope of what happened in Woburn. The Purple County is where Woburn is located, and the groundwater during this um, during this uh, uh, this time period became contaminated with something called volatile organic compounds (VOCs), and that includes trichloroethylene, that's the TCE we talked about, tetrachloroethylene, we're going to shorten that to PCE. Now there is a local river nearby and they actually did a study to see that the sediments in the river were also contaminated with polycyclic aromagic hydrocarbons, right, PAHs, and heavy metals such as chromium, zinc, mercury, and arsenic. So the soil then was contaminated not only with those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, but polychlorinated biphenols, PCBs, VOCs, and lots of pesticides. Read this here, friends. People are at risk if they touch or swallow contaminated groundwater, soil, or sediment from that river. If you even touch it, you are at a risk of contamination the site is located on land that served as the recharge area, the recharge area, right? The, the river was where the groundwater system was actually being recharged from the river and was getting into the aquifer that supplied wells G and H for the town of Woburn. Huge problems. Let me show you really quickly how this worked for the town. This is a map of the town, right? So north is this way. Here is wells G and H, all right? These, R, U, and C, are the three companies that were actually um, sued. You can actually see the same thing over here on this map. Here's well G, here's well H. This is uh, R on that map. This is the Riley Tannery. Okay, this is the, a tannery is where they actually tan um, hides, right? Cow hides and horse hides to make leather. So that is where R is over here. This whole company right here is the Beatrice Corporation. So that all is, is signified by R over here. This is another company up here called Unifirst, right? It's shown by the U. And then this is the um, WR Grace company right here. And it's shown by C on this map. So those are the three organizations, the three companies that were part of the uh, lawsuit of Woburn, Massachusetts. Notice that the wells, right, sit right in between all three of these companies. And then more importantly, notice this is the river. The river actually flows right by the Riley Tannery and the, the river is what is acting as the recharge for wells G and H. 
the red dots over here are all of the different cases of leukemia that were found around Woburn. Um, I have shown, uh, I have shared this on As You Learn. I'm pretty sure this isn't going to work if I do it on here. Yeah, I've shared on As You Learn, there are some amazing animations of the contaminant plumes and how they moved through the region to contaminate wells G and H. And I'll put those up on um, As You Learn for you. Let me just kind of show you. This is a screenshot from one of those animations. North is to the top of the page. They're measuring the movement of a contaminant called TCE. And instead of doing it in parts per million, they're actually doing it in parts per billion. OK, so this is this is small stuff, but you'll see how um, how uh, concentrated this stuff gets. The way that you watch these animations is that the image over here, this stuff. OK, this is a map view. So notice that you're looking down from a map, there's well G, there's well H, there's the Riley Tannery, and there's Olympia, which is part of Beatrice, there's Unifirst, and there's Grace, okay? So the, the left side is a map. You're looking down from space at the plumes and how the plumes are coming towards wells G and H over time. The image that you're gonna see in here in this little inset box, this is a cross section. Okay, so you're kind of looking at um, the underground beneath well H. And so this is the Olympia company over here, right? Here's Unifirst and here's Grace. So this is showing you the, uh, the depth to the well. So this is where the well is pulling from. And then the color scheme in here is showing you how contaminated the groundwater is. So what you'll notice that over time is that the groundwater starts to become more green than orange than red, and then it starts to get drawn perfectly into the well. On the video, on the animation, you'll see that whenever the well is pumping, the well is actually gonna turn color, okay? The well will turn red when they're pumping, and I think it's black when it's not pumping. But you'll see that whenever they start to pump on those wells, it creates that drawdown and cone of depression around those wells and it pulls the contaminants straight into wells G and H. So check those out on As You Learn. It's only a couple of, uh, you know, 30 or 40 seconds worth, but it's a pretty amazing animation to show the contamination of those municipal wells. One of the reasons why Woburn, Massachusetts uh, had such a contamination problem was because of what was happening in the subsurface geology. If the Grace Corporation was over here, the river was right here, and the wells were being put in kind of here, like here's well H, all the stuff underneath, all of the sediment underneath the Grace Corporation and the other two companies, and under the river channel was all this loose glacial material. So remember what we said about things that help have a high porosity, what were the things that we said had high porosity? Large grain size, right? You wanna have large grain sizes. That's the barrel full of basketballs. You want it to be well sorted, right? So they all have to be the same size and they have to be uncemented, right? All this stuff, these three things mean that you will have a very high permeability. Underneath Woburn, Massachusetts, there were uncemented, right, so loose, uncemented glacial deposits that were very, very coarse. Notice this, they're gravel, sand and gravel, which means that there was a very high permeability so that as soon as you put any sort of contaminant into the subsurface from these companies, it just moved very quickly into those wells. The flow rate in Woburn, Massachusetts was on the order of feet per year, sometimes 10 to 20 feet per year. So some of these companies were very close to those wells and the contamination was pretty instantaneous. There were 65 chemicals found in the Woburn wells altogether, and we're not going to talk about all of them, but a bunch of them were some of these really nasty guys, right? TCE, PCE, trichloroethane, chloroform, right? Chloroform is really, really bad. Here is essentially the EPA's maximum contamination level, so the MCL. This is in micrograms per liter, I realize, but let me just show you. 
this is the maximum contamination level in micrograms per liter that the EPA says is safe. This is the value that was found in the Woburn wells. Notice the huge increase in this stuff. MCLs for all these chemicals, this is what was actually measured in a lot of these. Chloroform has an MCL of 80 micrograms per liter. They had almost, almost more than 80,000 micrograms per liter, orders of magnitude higher than what was considered safe. So of course it's no it's no wonder why then um, there were high cases of leukemia and it's not just happening in uh, Massachusetts this has happened in California this actually happened right here in North Carolina there was a um, <clears throat> excuse me a dry cleaner out near um, Cherry Point uh, the marine base that it's on the coastal plain and the dry cleaner was dumping a lot of harsh chemicals out behind their dry cleaner and it got into the loose sand aquifers underneath the coastal plain and it was contaminating the water supply for the Cherry Point um, Marine Base. Uh, lots of, uh, of Marines were getting sick and they've traced it back to the um, problem with the dry cleaner. So the movie and the book, A Civil Action, is based on what happened in Woburn, Massachusetts. So you guys might have seen the movie, right? Um, this is the John Travolta movie, actually. Uh, so John Travolta played the lawyer who took over the case, uh, Jan Schlichtman, and he tried the case for the eight families, and it actually caused Schlichtman to, to go bankrupt. Um, he actually ended up losing his practice and everything else. And if you read the book or watch the movie, you'll know, by the way, this is one of the movies that you can do for your movie project. And it's great that we just did a whole bunch of information for you. But the case was actually not settled until 1982. It was settled for $8 million. And that was split among eight families. Thankfully, Schlickman decided to do all of the lawyering for free, so none of the families had to pay for any of the legal um, services that he provided. But each of these families, remember, had lost a family member, had tons of medical bills. So in the end, even though they did end up suing the companies and winning $8 million, uh, the families ended up with very little after paying all their medical bills. But they were able to actually find that, sure, there were lots of toxic materials just being dumped out behind tons of these factories. And all of those um, metal barrels were just deteriorating in the natural environment and contaminating the groundwater system. I updated this a couple of years ago because I was kind of curious as to, you know, how bad are things right now in Woburn? Um, it has now been uh, considered a Superfund site by the EPA. Woburn, Massachusetts is now a Superfund site. 30 years later, and it's now been $21 million uh, devoted to cleaning up the area of Woburn, Massachusetts. The wells are still contaminated, and no one actually knows whether humans are still being exposed to the chemicals that were still found in the Woburn aquifer. So here's the citation for that quote and for these numbers here if you want to look up what this stuff still looks like right now. But there are still problems in Woburn, Massachusetts. It's very hard to get this stuff out of the subsurface. But not all hope is lost. I do want to end on a positive note that there are ways <clears throat> that we are able to get some of this stuff out of the subsurface. And one thing that is um, becoming a really big uh, environmental geology uh, subfield is um, is bioremediation. So how can you actually train little bacteria doohickeys to uh, learn to eat pollutants or chemicals so that if you do have a situation where you have a pollutant in the subsurface, you can pump in these little um, biologically engineered critters and they can kind of um, diffuse the situation. Another way you can do this is that some pollutants are actually absorbed by certain chemicals or minerals. So for example, clay minerals can actually absorb <clears throat> water and other uh, types of liquids. So if you had a pollutant in your aquifer, you could pump down clay into that and that clay would hopefully then kind of absorb the polluted water that was in that area. And perhaps then you could excavate that zone of the aquifer and pull that contaminated clay out. 
Uh, many different types of chemicals will react with oxygen. So it's very easy if you have a contaminant, you can actually just kind of puncture the aquifer where that contaminant is and then pump in oxygen and the oxygen will oxidize the contaminant, sometimes creating a less toxic material that can then be either removed or will eventually just harmlessly dissipate throughout the aquifer. We talked already about how you can use um, biologically uh, engineered materials. Bioremediation is a huge field right now. But one other thing that seems to be doing really well is this idea of using what's called injection wells. So we'll look at this in this situation down here. Let's imagine that we have a contaminant in the subsurface down here, right? If we put in wells that puncture the contaminated part of the aquifer, what we can then do is put in other wells on the sides of the um, contaminated region and pump down either water or steam into the aquifer. What we're trying to do is essentially force water up towards the contaminant plume. And what will happen is that all this water being forced upwards towards the contaminant plume will push the contaminant out of the uh, pollution wells and you can actually kind of get it out that way until you start to see fresh water pumping through, then you know that the contaminant has been removed. So not all hope is lost. There are certainly ways that we can actually get rid of some of this stuff, but it certainly is challenging uh, and does take time.